Welcome to this presentation um, where I aim to tell you a little bit more about bioinformatics, um, what it is and what it can be used for, and the requirements um, to actually pursue a degree in bioinformatics at Stellenbosch um, University. So if we go to the slides, <clears throat> um, the formal definition of bioinformatics is that um, it's an interdisciplinary science um, of gathering, manipulating, storing, retrieving, and analyzing biological data using computers. So that is um, quite a formal definition. I think a, a, a relaxed definition would be it's the use of computers to analyze biological data. So <clears throat> we all know that we're living in an era of big data, and it's not simply that we're sequencing enormous amounts of genomes and generating genome sequence, um, but also the, the big data that are being generated are posts to social media, Facebook, Twitter, um, Getter, etc., cetera, um, as well as uploads and downloads of videos to YouTube. So all this contributes to a enormous amount of data that is being moved on a daily basis or generated on a daily basis and certainly a significant subsection of that is biological data. So the next slide basically shows you the rate at which we're generating uh, biological data by sequencing genomes. And you'll see that there's a very clear inflection um, in the rate of sequencing around about 2009. And that is when we started using highly parallelized processes where millions of DNA molecules are simultaneously, or billions of molecules are simultaneously sequenced in modern parallel apparatus. Um, this basically caused us to generate um, data at a rate where we will have produced one exa base pair of data by 2020. And obviously, it's, it's of tremendous scientific value to have this genome data, but exactly what does it mean? How do we go about making sense of the large amount of genome data that we are generating? Um, so what is the information useful for? Um, and um, why do we need the genome sequence data? So this is just a little a snippet of DNA sequence data. You'll be familiar with the four letters, G, A, T, and C, uh, to represent the four nucleotide bases in DNA. And um, each chromosome will be a con continuous stretch of sequence from the one end, or telomer, to the other end, or telomer. And um, in the case of bacteria, obviously, these would be circular genomes. Um, but we end up with having these gigantic files um, containing four letters and uh, just a, a, a sequence and a, a certain arrangement of these, these four letters. And the point is, well, what does it mean? Can we make sense of this arrangement of letters? And the, the answer to that is yes, we can. By using bioinformatics, we can go in and we basically try and find specific sequence patterns um, that, that indicate the start of genes, that indicate the end of genes, that indicate the end, say, of an intron um, or an exon. Um, there are specific transcription factor binding sites that we, can, that we can identify. And by doing this type of pattern recognition and sequence analysis of these sequence files, one can actually get what is referred to as an annotated genome, and this can be visualized um, in a browser such as this, which is basically a genome browser, where this is just a teeny weeny bit of the, the genome sequence, um, showing the presence of the various genes, so one can see where the various genes are, and you can overlay on these genome browsers additional information, such as, for instance, the methylation state of the DNA at specific positions, or other modifications associated with the DNA. Um, so it is, it is tremendously valuable to actually have the information because then you know where the genes are and you can start asking questions about the individual genes. One of the reasons why one would want to ask questions about individual genes 
is that if you basically look at the genome sequence of a number of individuals and you align those genome sequences, then often you will find that all the individuals in the population do not have the identical genome sequence. They actually um, um, change or are, are altered at specific locations. And these are known as mutations, and if it's single nucleotide specifically referred to as a single nucleotide polymorphism of ankle nucleotide polymorphisma. And these single nucleotide polymorphisms are extremely important um, because you can actually use them and look at the association of these polymorphisms with um, spe specific disease states in humans. Um, so one would take and look at, G perform basically a genome-wide association study um, to see if there's a link and identify a link between a specific um, single nucleotide polymorphism and the disease state. And we've identified very many SNPs that are associated with a multitude of human diseases. So, for instance, in this table, this is just a, a very, very small um, um, taster of the number of uh, mapped diseases. So, um, some of the more well-known um, diseases, for instance, type 1, type 2 diabetes are associated with specific SNPs, something like bipolar disorder, uh, multiple sclerosis, um, all of them are associated with um, either one or a multitude of different SNPs. And the important thing is it's therefore possible to actually go to an individual and sequence the genome and see whether specific SNPs are present in the genome of an individual. And if the SNPs are present, then one would know that that particular person has a higher risk of developing that specific diseased condition. So this type of approach is also extremely important if you look at, uh, at baby genomes. So it's perfectly possible to go and take a very, very small sample um, um, from a baby inside the, um, the mouth of the baby, for instance, and sequence the genome of that baby. And that will allow you with a, a snapshot of um, all, the, all the SNPs that are basically carried within the genome of that particular um, individual. So um, there has been a project in the US known as BabySeq where they actually did a test run on um, about 170 newborn babies where they sequenced the genomes. And they found that 3.5% um, of those perfectly normal babies in fact had, had SNPs associated with adult onset conditions. Um, these included hereditary breast cancer, ovarian cancer, Lynch syndrome. 88% of the babies were carriers of recessive conditions, which means that if they happen to have children with a, 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 a life mate with similar um, a recessive condition, then the chance of actually um, manifesting it as a disease state um, is, is, is very high. Um, also, 5% of the babies had pharmacogenetic variants, which could influence the susceptibility um, to specific drugs. Um, six of the newborns had variants related to hypertro hypertrophic um, cardiomyopathy, or heart disease. And these were linked to three genes, the Titan gene, um, um, as well as VCL and MyBPC3. Um, and one infant was found to have biallelic variants in the biotinidase deficiency-linked gene. So it's clear that looking at baby genomes um, allows you to actually make informed decisions in terms of lifestyle and possible medical intervention for a lot of risk areas um, uh, for that particular individual that may develop and manifest itself um, later in life. Um, this is just the slide um, with the Afrikaans translation of the previous slide. Um, another point is that if you look at genetic profiles, um, then you would find that there are differences between different population groups and demographic groups. So, for instance, the uh, profile mapped to white males um, is not, not um, particularly um, applicable, say, to looking at an Asian population or an Inuit population 
um, etc. So it is, it is really essential um, to actually start looking at genomes well beyond um, just single uh, population groups. And we've been doing that. Um, so we've actually mapped the genomes and sequenced the genomes of um, population groups from a, a tremendous um, variety of um, different groups um, of humans on the planet. Um, and we actually have a very good representation um, from a large selection of, um, of population groups at this time. Um, another point that one should um, um, think about is that if you look at the, um, at the, at the genetic profile or the SNP profile of an individual, um, one should be aware that in the, the genomes of individuals can differ uh, by as many as 20,000 SNPs, so from individual one to individual two. And this has an effect on the pharmacogenomic um, profile of that individual. So it may be that, that some individuals are responsive to medicine A, um, some re um, individuals do not respond to medicine A, but to medicine B. Some individuals re require a much higher dosage of medicine B, and some require um, medicine C. So essentially, depending on your, your SNP profile in your genome, um, that should inform some decisions in terms of um, th um, therapies and therapeutic doses. And this is also a very actively research area um, in bioinformatics today. Um, then finally, at what I'd like to touch upon is um, looking at algorithm development. Um, so algorithm development is particularly um, relevant to the individuals that enjoy coding. So sitting down and writing computer programs and solving problems and implementing those um, solutions in computer programs. So what I'm showing here is that, for instance, one of the algorithms that we're currently working on is um, looking at the three-dimensional spatial structure of the genome in the cell nucleus. Um, and what we do is we cross-link the, um, the genome so that one can deduce the proximity of various genes uh, or sections of the genome to one another in space. If they can be cross-linked, they, they must be close together. And if they're not cross-linked, that means that they, are, that they are quite distant. And using this proximity data to derive a possible three-dimensional structure of the genome um, in the nucleus. And this has um, a very high and important applicability in our understanding of the regulation of genes um, under specific conditions, under specific cellular um, conditions. So this is just one um, example. There are many, many more examples um, that I can give, but um, due to the um, brevity of the talk, um, I don't have time to go into. Um, so to summarize what I've told you, um, bioinformatics is basically to manage the storage of biological data in appropriate formats. It's to design databases and interfaces to allow efficient data retrieval. It's to develop new algorithms and implement those in new programs. It's to develop new analysis methods and software tools. And it's also to use the software tools to analyze biological data sets. And it's a research of the application of cutting edge methods such as machine learning and artificial intelligence to biological problems. And lastly, it's to ask novel, interesting questions about living systems and think of ways to answer these, contributing to human knowledge by doing so. Okay, so at Stellenbosch University, we have a number of degree options in bioinformatics. So we have the undergraduate offering as an interdisciplinary um, BSc in the stream bioinformatics and computational biology. Um, then we also offer a BSc honors degree in bioinformatics and computational biology as well as a master's degree, MSc, and a PhD doctorate in bioinformatics and computational biology. So you have the entire pipeline to proceed from undergraduate training all the way through to a doctorate in bioinformatics and computational biology at Stellenbosch University. Um, the requirements for entry into this particular degree program is basically having a six in um, a mathematics, and then a four in physical science, and then a four in um, either English, Afrikaans, home language, or first additional language. Um, what can you do if you're qualified as a bioinformatician? 
Um, so if you want to stay in academia, you can basically establish your own bioinformatics research group at a university or at an institute, or you can be a member of an established research group where you basically are involved in um, analyzing data generated by the research group, or you can work at a central core facility where you give support to people generating data and help them with analysis. Um, if you choose to go into the health or biotechnology industry, private sector, um, you can look at bioinformatics consultancy, um, you can look at bioinformatics software development, um, you can look at drug design, so in the um, um, pharmacological industry that is a very, very active and hot area is the virtual design of drugs and um, fitting molecules, specific, specific enzymes to try and minimize the um, or identify a smaller group of molecules that you need to test for um, a biological or therapeutic efficacy. Um, apart from drug design, you can also do genome analysis. We basically analyze genomes and this will increasingly become an area of relevancy um, as we um, mature in the genomic era and will um, increasingly be used by large insurance groups um, where they would be interested in genome sequences of, um, of individuals. You can also be involved in biomarker discovery where you, where you identify specific genes, SNPs, or um, more specifically proteins or mutants of proteins that are associated with specific diseased states. Um, pharmacogenomics, basically um, trying to establish a relationship between genomes and specific um, therapeutic sensitivities of individuals, and then personalized medicine, where you basically make use of the entire um, bioinformatic profile in terms of the genome and or proteome and or metabolome, which is the entire um, pattern of the um, metabolic state in an individual. Um, and relate that to an informed choice uh, for therapy or dosage for an individual. Um, so this is a very quick overview of where one would um, be um, commercially or academically active um, in the bioinformatics field. And if you have any additional information um, on bioinformatics or computational biology, my name is Hugh Patterton and I'm with the Center of Bioinformatics and Computational Biology, and you are very welcome to give me a call or to send me an email. Um, you can also visit our website at www.sun.ac.za um, forward slash SCI um, hyphen bioinformatics, that is our website, um, or you can drop by um, for a physical visit. I'm in room 212B in the B wing of the JC Smuts building um, on the Stellenbosch campus. Um, so that basically concludes my presentation. Um, thanks for attending um, and listening, and I hope to see um, a sizable proportion of the audience at the bioinformatics lectures at Stellenbosch University um, in the year and um, next year. Thanks very much.